So good morning and good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. This is the second panel at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference about digging into health and medicine. My name is Serena Tinari. I'm based in Switzerland and here is still really early in the morning, but we are really happy to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator of this session and a little bit also a speaker. So I will uh, first give you a little introduction to this panel and then I will give the floor to the, my co-speakers. So first of all, this is the organization I co-founded with Catherine Riva, which is also a speaker today. It's called ReCheck, Investigating and Mapping Health Affairs. So we work with the methods, the tools and the ethics at the intersection between investigative journalism and evidence-based medicine, so-called EBM. They share many things, but uh, most importantly, they share an hypothesis-driven approach, which, as we know, is really important in investigative journalism and journalism, generally speaking. So what EBM means, we believe is always important to explain that. Uh, any course of action uh, needs to be based on the best available evidence, scientific evidence. And when there is uncertainty, this needs to be communicated. In the case of the evidence-based medicine to the patients, in our case, to the public. So. EBM is a lot about what we know and what we don't know and about being systematical. So we believe really there is something in common between EBM and investigative journalism. So first of all, uh, that's a bit of a um, standard, we believe. Uh, these are our conflicts of interest or so-called disclosures. So we are the founders and directors of this organization and we don't have direct or indirect pharmaceutical or medical devices funding, which we believe um, is quite important in this field. Uh, on our website, you find plenty of information anyway about uh, our project and what we do. Um, basically, we are anyway implicated in projects with academics in the States and in Canada, and we are paid contributors with the British Medical Journal. And we use Twitter uh, in terms of social media. So these are the handles. You can follow us if you feel like. So uh, we have been writing on commission of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Uh, this guide uh, is called Investigating Health and Medicine and is currently available in seven languages. It's in open access. So you find it on the GIJN website and it's published under Creative Commons license. This means that can be also reproduced, republished after having checked in with us and or with GIJN. So the guide has been conceived and uh, put together before uh, this uh, global um, crisis uh, started actually. But we finalized it when it had already started. So there is also an introduction and chapter about uh, investigating COVID-19. Uh, the guide is conceived really as a handbook. Um, it's, I mean, it's aimed at journalists, but we believe can be also useful for NGOs and people generally speaking working in this field or being interested. That's why we, we did really our best with the support of GIJN to write it in a layperson language. So don't be afraid, you can read it even if you don't have a background in this field. And you can read it as a, as a book from page one to page 100. Or you can just jump into chapters when you are like going to cover a topic and you feel like you might be actually helped by, by a little background. And it's really packed with links and resources. So there are about 400 links in this guide. So you can look at it online and of course you can click on every single link or you can also download it as a PDF if you prefer so, if you prefer to print it for instance. 
So I will, this is like what you all find inside. That's what I'm saying that uh, the chapters can be important for you, for your work to look at it. For instance, if you need to report about drugs or vaccine, for instance, it's always a good idea to know a little bit the background, right? So we have, for instance, a chapter about regulating drugs, which will tell you all the basics, how a product is coming to the market, how it's uh, developed, and how it's actually regulated. But there is really much more than that in the guide, and we encourage everyone to have a look at it because, I mean, that's been really published with the public interest in mind. So you will see in the guide there is a, some, something specific about COVID-19, and these are some of the take-home messages, actually. Uh, we believe, for instance, that it's very important to be cautious about the models. Uh, in these two years, they, they have been uh, all the time modeling, and modeling is very tricky. First of all, because it depends by the quality of the data you feed into a model. It's, after all, a mathematical model. And then because models, per se, they are kind of predictions, right? So predictions, as we know, uh, they are uh, rather often, they can be flawed. Uh, we think it's really important to stick to the best available scientific evidence, which is very difficult in these times because there is a lot of noise and confounding factors. We believe it's super important you provide always context uh, because you need to know and also say to the audience what is actually normal before, for instance, saying that this is totally abnormal. Uh, because for the audience, it's otherwise very difficult to uh, place facts and also your reporting. Uh, we suggest you to not fall for the hype, because this is a time of hype anyway. And we have to say, frankly, to be beware of media reporting. Because, you know, uh, Catherine and I, and also Syed, we work in this field since mm, quite some time. But what we know is that in these two years... Uh, virtually every journalist became a, a medical reporter. And we see many problems in this uh, at ReCheck because this is not really a field you can improvise. So although we are really uh, sympathetic with our colleagues, uh, we believe there is a, really the need um, of a better reporting in this field because pandemic journalism didn't do always really a great job, probably. That's an opinion. So how do you investigate uh, health and medicine? This is the topic of this panel today. And in today's session, we are going to look specifically uh, at some points because, of course, we don't have 12 hours. Um, we will see uh, with Catherine how to use a specific tool for your investigation. And she will explain us what to do out of it and what it is. And uh, it's, a, it's a tool we recommend because can really help you to refine your investigative question in this field and maybe eventually uh, help you to avoid some pitfalls or mistakes. We all do mistakes. Uh, we will look a little bit uh, what does it mean to get your numbers straight, because not everyone is very skilled with numbers, and that's okay. And then with uh, Syed Nazakat, we will get more into getting health data with the freedom of information um, legislations that there are in many different countries. So um, this is um, just to give you a really wide introduction. Uh, this is the big family of the medical research studies. Because, I mean, you hear all the time on the media and yourself as a journalist, now we always say, like, a study has shown that. And in these two years, there was really so much of this. But as you can see in this slide, we call it the scary slide because we are aware that sometimes can be a bit like, oh, my God, how I can do this? Uh, these are all the different uh, studies that you can have, actually. And they are very different uh, from each other. Like each of them um, have rules of the games. Uh, they have different design, so they are conceived in a specific way. And each of them can be really good, just that they do different things. So not 
the studies are never uh, a study, it's not just a study. And we believe that for journalists, and especially for investigative journalists, it's super important to know the difference between them. Because the results you can get from this or that can be very different in terms of solidity of the evidence. So we always recommend our students to print this and hang it maybe in your office. And when you have to report about a study, go and check, okay, hang on a sec, what is that exactly? Why a study is not just a study? Because some are more prone to bias or confounding factors. Uh, in a nutshell, this is like a systematic error, is a deviation from the truth, is something that can uh, heavily influence the result of the study. So this can lead to overestimating, underestimating, or just like misreading, misinterpreting the, the result of, a, of an intervention. An intervention clearly in medicine is something you do. Uh, it can be a drug, it can be a something you do in, uh, in the population. So it's something you try and do in order to improve basically the health of a single individual or a population. And the systematic error can come in many sh shapes and colors, but can be, for instance, in a study in the design. So how this study was conceived in the recruitment, how the patients were selected or the subject or the data collection or data analysis, for instance. So you can really end up um, having some problems with uh, scientific studies. That's why it's very important to always place them where do they do belong, actually. Uh, common bias is an observed association. It's really the most common you can find. That's why when someone tells you, hey, there is a study that has shown that, we show always this bias in terms of we believe is something that you can relate to. So you always have to ask yourself, is there really a cause and effect association? And you have to ask yourself if the association could be actually due to chance, because this happens rather often. Or distortions. So there is something that has influenced the study's results. This is very important. This is a, a typical example I think everyone can relate to. Uh, actually, we, we say that statistics can uh, get air anything out of the bag. This means that in the guide you find the whole chapter about this and you find also some very interesting books to look at that, to go a bit uh, deep into this topic, um, uh, potentially you can always establish a link be be between two phenomena. And this is a typical example because both ice cream sales and shark attacks increase when the weather is hot and sunny, uh, but they are not <laughs> caused by each other, right? So, but as you see, you can always put, put there, um, you can show a correlation even though Actually, there is no real link between these two phenomena. And this is another example. This is um, a study that was done in Germany that uh, managed to demonstrate that there is a correlation between uh, storches and babies. As we know, it's just like a, a traditional thing, what used to be that we used to say that babies are brought by storches. We know that's not the case. But this scientist managed actually to write, design, and publish uh, a very good study demonstrating that actually, as you can see, there is a clear direct correlation between these two phenomena. So this is extremely important for us as a journalist to keep always this in mind. So when we present something or say the public health authorities, for instance, tell us, hey, we know this works you have to make sure that there is not this kind of a bias or a confounding factor. This is how, uh, that's the other slide that we always recommend to print because we know it's a bit complicated, the most if you're not really into this field. Uh, this is a, a simplified version. Uh, these are the studies, basically the most important ones that you have seen in the big scary slide. So, uh, to simplify, you can put them on a pyramid, actually, 
And as you can see on the right side of your screen, there is the grade of recommendation. So this is an international standard. And on the left, you see the level of evidence. So as we know, uh, the so-called uh, golden standard is the is a meta-analysis, is a systematic review, uh, basically on randomized controlled trials. I know this might sound a bit jargony, but uh, really, if you go into the guide, you're going to get on speed about all these things. This can help you when you're going to actually be in some sort of uh, confronted to a study and you don't know exactly what to do out of that. I would just point at the lowest uh, blue um, part of this slide. Uh, this is actually, technically speaking, is considered no evidence, which is experts' reports or opinions, uh, so-called consensus conferences, and also the clinical experience of uh, respected authorities or medical doctors or scientists without transparent evidence. Transparency is very important in every field, but in this field is especially important. So we encourage you to be very careful with experts' opinion. Of course, journalists, we do rely a lot on experts and experts' opinion, but we really encourage you to look at it per se as no scientific evidence, because that's how it works in the medical research, and we believe it makes sense this way. And when someone proposes you a study to tell you, hey, this is shown in this study, first of all, place it on this pyramid. S check where, where is it, so you can a bit already assess what is the level of this evidence you have. We have this very simplified ver version of this pyramid, and as you can see, uh, you can call it A, so the highest level is a meta-analysis, or at least one randomized controlled trial. Randomized controlled trial, in a nutshell, is what we all know probably about. You take two groups of people that should be very comparable, so you have to balance them, and one group gets the intervention, say a drug or a vaccine, or an intervention in the, in the population, say you let one group of people wearing face masks, and the other group of people, you don't give them the intervention. So you give them a placebo, or you just ask them to not wear any mask. Ideally, a randomized controlled trial should be blinded. So the two groups should know if they are getting the intervention or the non-intervention, placebo, or whatever. And also the doctor and the nurse um, administrating the intervention shouldn't know. Of course, it's not always possible. Uh, someone not wearing a mask, of course, is going to be aware they are not wearing a mask. But it's still the most powerful design to try and avoid confounding factors. So look for that, for your reporting. And then lower comes any other type, basically, of clinical and epidemiological studies. Although, as we mentioned already, there are still some study designs, which maybe are not really the golden standard, but could be interesting to answer a question. Or very often is also the case that they give you, they help you to formulate your research question. So here we are speaking uh, about the field of health and medicine. This means science, public health, but also investigative journalism. So all these rules do apply to all of that. And then on the lowest level, you have expert opinion without transparent evidence of scientific solid, something you can really work with. So I'll give now the floor to Catherine Riva. Uh, Catherine, she's uh, also, as I also am, uh, she's an investigative journalist based in Switzerland. And also for Catherine, it's very early morning at the moment. So good morning, and you have the good floor. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. Uh, so could you share the, the screen, uh, Serena, uh, so I can see uh, the presentation? So uh, let's talk a little bit uh, now um, on the, uh, a tool uh, that uh, has been invented uh, um, at the beginning uh, to, uh, in order to help doctors uh, doing 
better research in the scientific literature. Um, uh, the idea was uh, to give them a simple tool uh, to answer clinical questions in the right way. Uh, the principle is you have to break down your clinical questions in four dimensions, and if you can find uh, relevant solid information or, uh, on those four dimensions, uh, you can do some recommendations to your patient. Um, uh, it's also a, a very good tool uh, to assess uh, studies. And uh, we uh, think it's important to encourage journalists uh, uh, to use this tool because it's not so complicated. It has a lot of advantages and uh, it's, it helps you in a lot of ways. So what is the PICO formula? P, uh, you have four letters. So P is for patient populations or problems. Uh, the health issues, the I is uh, for the intervention. Intervention, it could be a drug, a surgical procedure, a vaccine. Um, it could be another intervention into the population. Uh, C is the comparator. Uh, Serena uh, pointed out uh, how important randomized control trial are. Uh, the, the term control refers precisely uh, to this. Uh, so it means uh, to what has been uh, the intervention compared to. Uh, what is, it can be, for example, a placebo. It can be another, treat, another treatment, another test, and so on. And finally, we have the O for outcome. So outcome is uh, the measured result in the, um, uh, uh, in the study. Uh, it's the assessing criteria. So basically it's the questions the trial is supposed to answer or the study is supposed to answer. Uh, the advantage of PICO uh, is on the one hand, uh, it helps you exploring data. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, and uh, not missing very uh, the, the the most uh, relevant dimensions, uh, um, and uh, it might help you uh, exploring data even on very delicate questions uh, and keeping a cool head. Serena, you can go to the next slide. Um, and we thought uh, actually now the most delicate questions is uh, might be vaccinating uh, should be vaccinating kids against COVID-19, because we have data on it. Uh, there has been a, a randomized control trial have, have been ruled. And um, so we have, uh, we have information on it. So let's try to apply PICO uh, in order to see what kind of information we have uh, uh, as a result of those trials. So uh, let's start with P. So if you look at the data, at the published data of the, uh, the randomized control trial, we can see that uh, the participants in this, uh, in this study were healthy kids, uh, five to 11 years old. Uh, the intervention has been community, so the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. As a comparator, the investigators use uh, saline placebo, it means salt water. Um, uh, it's supposed to be inert. And uh, as the outcome, and that's the main difference uh, uh, if you compare to uh, the trial that, uh, who, uh, the, which has been ruled uh, uh, with adults, uh, uh, the outcome was not, uh, is this vaccine able to prevent uh, COVID-19 disease? Uh, um, they just looked is, uh, are the kids participating in our trial building neutralizing antibody response? And here um, we really have to, uh, ex to, to take a, a closer look on it because um, neutralizing antibody response is not what we can call a hard outcome, a hard endpoint. It's what we call um, uh, surrogate endpoint because if you take this as an endpoint, you you say okay, we assume we are assuming that when kids build such antibody response, they will be protected against the disease. But we don't have proof that they will not develop the disease. So that's the first question we uh, we have to uh, we have to be aware of. Um, we also have to be aware of that they just test the measure, the, the, the vaccine, on healthy kids. They didn't, uh, they didn't test it on sick kids who could have uh, uh, immune system issues. Um, you can go to the next slide, Serena. 
And uh, all those questions, uh, um, uh, all those concerns uh, um, uh, have agitated as well uh, the members of the FDA panel uh, uh, who uh, that had to decide, uh, do they recommend an emergency use authorization uh, for a two-dose regimen to, uh, to kids? Um, because uh, for the the panel members, it was, I think, quite frustrating um, because uh, they, they just have uh, the choice to answer yes or no. They couldn't uh, make uh, a final distribution for the recommendation, and many have expressed issue with the lack of nuance in the vote because uh, the privileged cohort, the pri privileged population for such a vaccine should be um, uh, kids with autoimmune disease or kids uh, that are on immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and it was impossible to, uh, uh, to give uh, the emergency use authorization just for this population. And why does it matter? As we can see on the next slide, um, um, uh, kids uh, are not uh, the most vulnerable population to COVID disease. Uh, here we have the numbers put by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And as you can see, uh, the total accumulated hospitalization uh, uh, the kids were just 1.6 or 4.2 or 4.3 percentage of all the people hospitalized because of COVID. And uh, only uh, 0.1% to 2% of all the child uh, COVID cases resulted in hospitalization. So it's a very tiny portion of the population. And uh, when we look at the mortality, the numbers are even lower. So that's um, uh, so the, the kids are by by far not the vulnerable population, and uh, we should be extremely cautious when it's about kids because they are young. They have the whole life uh, in front of them, so the benefit harms ratio of the intervention must be extremely favorable. If we say okay, we recommend vaccination for the whole child population. But uh, uh, we, um, uh, as we, knew, uh, we know since two days, uh, the CDC recommends uh, this vaccine for children ages five to 11. And the same American Academy of Pediatrics uh, that have put these very interesting numbers about the real burden of COVID in the child population, they upload uh, this recommendation to kids. So there are a lot of issues um, uh, on this uh, on these topics and um, it, it's unfortunate, uh, uh, very few media asked questions on it. Uh, we had a lot of media cheerleading this decision, uh, but as we saw, there are some uh, issues. It, it's a lot of trade-off on this uh, on these topics. So uh, here are some resources we recommend uh, you to, to have a look on. Uh, there was a wonderful webinar organized by the BNG on the available evidence uh, for vaccinating children against COVID-19. It's very interesting to listen to those experts. Um, and uh, we do recommend you as well uh, to read thoroughly uh, the article Marianne Dimasi wrote uh, on this issue. Marianne Dimasi is a, a great Australian um, uh, medical uh, journalist. Uh, uh, it's, uh, she's doing a great job in the, the whole crisis, so really follow her, uh, you will learn a lot. So uh, now uh, when you have uh, split your study into the four uh, PICO, uh, PICO uh, dimensions, uh, so um, we, we will uh, take the look, um, um, so as Serena say, really look what is it uh, for a study. Is it a randomized control trial? In that case, you can assume, okay, the effect that had been observed is really due to the intervention. Uh, if it is an, an observational study, be very extremely cautious because of the confounding factors. Uh, you might come in a situation like with the stork or with the sharks and uh, it's bad reporting if you are uh, putting this, uh, so saying, uh, okay, we have, uh, we know there is a causal relationships uh, uh, between uh, uh, this intervention and this result. So um, be, uh, keep this in mind. Uh, 
because all studies are not equal. Um, I would like to underscore why, um, uh, what allows us to say that uh, a result of a randomized control trial uh, is, um, uh, is due to the, to the tested intervention uh, is because it's the only design that allows you uh, to uh, assume that the uh, only difference between uh, the intervention and the control group uh, is the intervention. And that's, uh, that's because of the randomization. That's why the, the term randomized control trial is so important. Uh, but um, uh, the, random, the, the, the safeguard of the randomization applies only for uh, the primary and the secondary endpoint that, has been, that have been defined in the protocol. If you have post hoc subgroup analysis, you have to be very cautious because the randomization doesn't work as a protection anymore. So, and uh, when you have a study, uh, you, a study is not just about uh, how, uh, how big was the efficacy. Uh, in public health, in health, in medicine, it always comes to uh, the benefit harms ratio. That's what it's all about. You always have, uh, you always need to put it in the context. Um, and uh, to, to, to put it, uh, to make it in the, in the best way, uh, uh, as shown in the next slide, you absolutely must be aware of uh, some shortcuts that uh, have the lead in our mind. Uh, there are cognitive shortcuts uh, that lead to a limited rationality. What does it mean? Um, click. We tend to struggle with probabilities. Uh, even if you are good at math, uh, it's very difficult to, to, for us to imagine, to visualize correctly percentages. And um, that's the first. Um, we tend to privilege natural frequency absolute values. So we, we like numbers, but we don't like percentages. And uh, there is another issue where we are uh, talking about sickness, death. It's the role of emotion. Uh, it might be also your own background. Maybe you have lost a relative or a friend on a, uh, on a sickness. And so it's very difficult in such a context to keep a cool head uh, and uh, to not uh, try to draw conclusion because it fits uh, with your own emotion. So uh, they have an especially powerful impact. So to understand and picture yourself risk-benefit ratio, it's very important to express them in the same way. It will help you as well to stay uh, as objective as possible in your reporting. Yeah. So if you look at, the, at this illustration, I bet um, um, for you, uh, it's very easy to understand uh, uh, the left part of the pictures. And um, uh, if you understand better the right part of the picture, so congratulations, you are very strong at uh, Bayesian uh, statistics. I'm not, for example, but both pictures express the same probability. So for your readers, for your audience, it will be also easier to understand if you put uh, uh, the, the results, uh, if you picture them in the way like on the left side. So, and please, please, please do not apply the methods of the pharmaceutical industry, expressing the benefit in percentage because it might so look bigger or more spectacular and uh, expressing the arms in, um, with absolute numbers because it makes look them uh, not so significant, tiny, not so important. Uh, it's misleading, it's not good reporting to do it, even if you, are, you feel enthusiastic about a, a new product, a, a new vaccine, a new drug, a new surgical intervention, please try to uh, keep in mind all what we said about shortcuts, about limited rationality, help your audience to, uh, to become knowledgeable and, um, uh, and, and avoid uh, uh, to, uh, to fall in the, uh, in the same trap uh, uh, like uh, the communicants of the pharmaceutical industry uh, try to put on. Uh, it's not, it's never helpful. Thank you, sir. I give Serena the floor back. 
Okay, thank you. So we are aware that um, at times we might use difficult words, right? That sound a bit like jargony. But again, um, be reassured that, for instance, if you go into the guide, you'll find also really layperson's explanations of all this. And unfortunately, if you want to dig deeper in health medicine, public health, you need to know all these words. Because once you are going to be, uh, for instance, interviewing uh, a public health expert, or maybe an expert, generally speaking, or maybe you are going to interview a company, um, you need to know these words. Otherwise, you won't be really able to, to do your job, right? Um, so the thing we want to also underline, because this is um, a recurring question, you can do it because basically uh, Catherine and I, for instance, we don't have a PhD in uh, statistics or epidemiology. And yet uh, with the time you can learn and it's possible to do it. So we really encourage you to feel empowered and just, of course, take your time to learn all these things. Otherwise, you will be like uh, always in a weaker position in front of a public health expert or a, or a company or also government. So we wanted to share with you just a couple of pandemic tips, like where do you get or we get uh, data from? Uh, we prefer to use our world in data. Uh, many used in these two years the Johns Hopkins um, data set. We do actually prefer to use this one. It's a long story, but anyway, you can compare them. Just have a look at it. And for Europe, there is a very interesting data set, which is Euromomo. Uh, of course, uh, the interesting thing is that the system, the methodology, and also the hints of Euromomo are good for any country. So wherever you are based, have a look at that. Could be very interesting for you. And we also recommend uh, strongly to look at national agencies for statistics, because they do this all the time, and the primary care monitoring databases. This is super interesting because, again, these places, they do the work all the time, not only uh, in this uh, very emotional crisis that's, that is uh, keeping the whole planet a bit in a, in a very special state at the moment. So we recommend really to, to look for good data if you can. And then this is again the guide which really has been conceived to help people like us. So we really recommend you to, to have a look at it and download it maybe. So I'm going to give now the floor to Syed. And we are very happy to have him here today with us. He has also a really long experience in this field and uh, Syed, you have the floor now. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it was great listening to um, you and Catherine and, 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 and the powerful way the journalists need to really improve their game in terms of uh, understanding and reporting on health. So I will just take a you know, quick five or 10 minutes to uh, you know, just share a couple of things. Uh, allow me to share my screen, but I think now, lungs one here has been a phenomenal, you know, uh, like uh, situation for all of us around the world. And as I think um, uh, Serena said in the morning, uh, in, in, the, in, in the start of session, uh, everyone eventually became a health editor or reporter. And there was no other way to do it because uh, this is the world's biggest ever story. We all covering uh, with different capacities, actually. And, and that also created a challenge, actually. That challenge created because one, uh, are we really well skilled to report on a subject like health and public health, and no matter you know, and leave aside the clinical trials and regulations. So that was the one challenge. And majority of newsrooms in the world realized, actually, like the health authority realized, that health was never a priority in newsrooms. You know, you, it was like you're lucky uh, if a big publication or a TV station will have a health editor or a health reporter. But the majority of publications around the world, particularly in, I can say uh, for sure from Asia Pacific, they hardly have a dedicated health reporting teams. So th the challenge was real. And, and, and COVID also gave us this opportunity to look at health in a much broader you know, way. 
in a sense that there are a lot of things to report on. It's not just about diseases. It's not only about, you know, like, uh, like deaths. It's not only about, for example, the, the, the cases. It's also about the, the funding to the health authorities. It's also about the corruption in the healthcare sector. It's also about the poor delivery system. It's also about the lack of accountability. So how do you cover these big stories and, and then inform and empower readers with a, something which directly is related to their health and well-being? So I think, which is, a, which is a, you know, good for, you can say, uh, for journalism overall, for investigative journalism overall, it, this was a good uh, movement to raise to occasions. And I can see from our experience in India and in the region, and some remarkable reporting happened actually in local newspapers. They really dedicated their best reporters and editors for, for covering situation in local languages, in Hindi, in Urdu, in Malayalam, in Tamil, in Bangla. So more and more reporters actually ended up becoming uh, health reporters. But the challenge again, as we have been saying, though we say though that this health is not really a rocket science, but is a science, it's a, it, it is, is a stream. Uh, and then um, somewhere down the line, there was a larger understanding that the reporters, editors really need to improve their understanding of the subject before they cover these big stories. Because it could be extremely difficult for you if you really do not understand the subject and you start writing about it and you start going by whatever quotes from opinion makers you're getting. Somebody will tell you that the COVID will end in two months without giving you any data and your headline next day will be, and the COVID will end in India or in Pakistan as per this scientist. So we saw that kind of reporting happening all the time. But I think the key for us, we, we, we are discussing watchdog reporting here. And key for us essentially is the fundamental rule that we really need to have an eye for patterns. What's happening at a massive scale? Not really going by one statement or what's one sudden rise in, a, in cases in one country. But what are the patterns overall? How can we expose and how can we put spotlight to, to help people understand these patterns? Like, you know, you can see different age groups falling sick. You can also look at, uh, the, you know, more, more focus essentially is on funding, which government is spending more on what, who is getting these big tenders? Uh, uh, is it a big lobby involved in facilitating of these big tenders, who are these individual companies, or is the consortium, who are the people behind now who are leading global health in terms of delivery systems, in terms of funding new major initiatives, because there's a huge funding available now, um, you know, related to COVID. Are we doing enough to understand the big business in the healthcare system? So we really need to pay attention to the patterns and try to understand like if, you, if, you're, if you're living in Malaysia or if you're living in Zimbabwe, you can figure out how many tenders, RFPs has your government issued in the last two years? Who got these tenders? Is there a one particular company? Does that company has a record, good record? What, what are they going to do with this money? How much money is eventually being you know, spent and all that? So I think it means a lot of mapping. And I remember at the very start of the COVID-19, uh, one of our colleagues at Delhi at Health Analytics Asia, she tried to understand uh, what is the reason behind COVID-19, why it spread so long and why we were not really able to understand it. Because we also understand that it's a zoonotic disease. It spreads from animals to human beings. And then we saw it's actually something which was happening for a long time. The China as a country was, was, has a huge business, legal and illegal, of, of wildlife businesses. And, and that was actually creating a situation where there was no oversight. 750% increase in the last three decades of global animal trade. And there's absolutely zero oversight, global oversight of this business. And then what, what the colleagues did actually at, at Data Lee is they analyzed 6 million official historical financial records to show essentially how China actually failed to curb the wildlife trade even after earlier outbreaks. And that really made us vulnerable for any future you know, outbreak, viral outbreak. And then imagine 52 countries actually cater, supply wildlife animals to China, 54 countries. 
So it's a huge global network. So it took a team, I think more than two months to put this data together of 6 million records. These were official entries made by China and shared that data with WHO. So data was available, but our team was actually able to have pattern. And you can see, look at Africa. Every country in Africa is supplying wildlife to China. Not only Africa, look at South Africa, look at like so many countries actually all across the world. So this actually uh, created a very major global problem, but we were able to maybe explain this very complex story by just mapping this data and having a pattern what's happening over the years, 10 years, five years, 15 years. Something we again put a spotlight in China because in, in the early phase of COVID, there were a lot of stories in China. We also looked at whether China is very honest with its numbers, how many cases, how many deaths. And we figured out how actually China collects health data. What is the way the China collects data when it, when it conducts, a, say, a test at a local village? What happens to this data? Because sometimes I feel also that watchdog reporting essentially is also mapping the process, how governments function actually, and what is the problem, you know, how, how government function. And we realize actually China is not really so transparent with its data. And one of the first cases that Dr. Lee who was arrested and jailed because he went public and said there's something wrong in Wuhan and he was jailed and interrogated. And then that story also got a lot of attention because uh, it was also done with the help of a Chinese journalist because she was able to actually watch and monitor a lot of conversation on WeChat in which people were saying, two people died. I'm talking about this early first two months of COVID-19 when there was no global outbreak, you know, global you know, attention to the whole disease. And then she was able to actually map the data collected from the WeChat and we were able to figure out what, is, what are people talking in Wuhan, in Beijing, in Shanghai? What are the concerns in, in January of that year? And then the FAB actually. So that really also helped us to figure out what is going on uh, in these countries. Then India had a devastating, devastating situation last year. Imagine half a million people in India have died because of COVID. Half a million people. So, and then we saw beds were not available there. And we realized there were a lot of discrepancy in data. The hospitals on their online platform will say, we have 100 beds available. But when you go and visit the hospital, there were no beds. So there was a lot of, you can say, uh, big stories actually behind these number fudging and all. And then it was very important to show the scale to the world. I think the photojournalists did something amazing. It was painful. It was disturbing. But they did amazing work by putting spotlight on how the whole machinery has failed in terms of dealing with the COVID-19 situation. But there are more stories like, you know, the big stories which are awaiting to be told, you know, for a global audiences. These stories can be anything. It could be an air pollution in India and China. Again, massive, massive casualties are happening because of air pollution in India and China and other countries in the region. But the question is, do we really have understanding how to tell these stories to, to a larger audience, how to collect data and evidence about these stories. So I think number of big stories out there, I think the key for us is to develop a kind of a data frame of mind actually, to understand numbers in a way that, that you can explain a process, explain a disease separate actually. And this could be done in terms of essentially identifying two, three staff members in your team or a one person completely dedicated to a beat to a public health, but some understanding of numbers if you're dealing with a lot of numbers and you have a lot of numbers available. Because in most of countries, now essentially what's happening, the lot of numbers available by the government, like your annual reports, your audit reports, your expenditure on health, your manpower reports, hospital audits, the, and financial report. These are all big PDF files, 100 pages, 200 pages, a budget is 20,000 page document, all numbers, 20,000 page numbers. How do you understand these numbers? So the key is also in this whole process to understand and ask before you start looking for answers. Who controls this data? Is it a garment study? And all kind of those questions. What was the methodology used in this? Or is this a financial record? If this is an audit report, who conducted this audit in which year? And all those things. So answer as many questions as possible because that will actually help you to build this framework to do a big story. 
It's something like where you can, your, your team is able to use massive chunk of data to understand the whole process. The key is also in most of countries now, luckily in Asia now, at least 13 countries, uh, we have a Freedom of Information uh, Act, which is a remarkable, remarkable tool. But I still do not see a journalist, number of journalists using it quite often. Like imagine in, a, in, in, in India, for example, on average, every year, the people file 4 million applications under the Freedom of Information Act. To me, 4 million applications mean 4 million stories from India alone, because every application is a story. So how do you, like you will be never short of stories if you start using Freedom of Information Act beautifully. Even China has a Freedom of Information Act. You can get data from China. I know it's complicated there, but they still have an act. Sri Lanka has it, Bangladesh has it, Pakistan has it. So Asia in the last couple of years, new thing for us, I think in India, hardly 13, 14 year old process, but now remarkable, remarkable insight using this RTI, we call it RTI, Right to Information Act, uh, a data for big stories to confirm stories as well. Even if you have a data, you can confirm that by using and by submitting application to the government. I also think it's very important to monitor what's happening on social media. And last year, we did a research with the help of Google in which we tried to figure out what people are searching on internet about health. The majority of people across the world, the most searched thing on internet are issues related to health, which is very unique and very strange, actually. We never thought people are searching so much about health on internet. Even uh, before meeting a doctor, People actually prefer to Google and do a little bit of research and then go have an appointment with the doctor. And it was very interesting to see what are people actually writing? Like uh, you can see these couple of questions and you can get an idea. People can be extremely uh, very normal people and they have a normal questions. Like, can I buy a newspaper uh, because uh, it may infect my family because of COVID? Or is coronavirus more active in non-vegetarians? So it gives you a cultural understanding as well. Why are people asking this question? Should I stop eating all the mutton and chicken and all? Will be I saved from COVID-19? All kind of very basic questions, but that actually gives you a sense of what is happening on internet, on social media. And there are a number of stories you can do about it. Why are people misled about a particular situation? Because they search something and they have then biases. They watch that thing again and again. I also feel, and that's my last point, I also feel um, there's a really strong need of, for collaboration with key domain experts. Collaboration with journalists, between journalists, great, that's wonderful, but journalists need to collaborate more with different domain experts, with scientists, with regulators, with doctors. And I think that will really help us because no matter how much we try to improve our knowledge, we will not be expert on medicine. A doctor will remain an expert on medicine. All we can do, maybe we can ask the right question to a doctor. Maybe we can ask, uh, we can ask him to confirm something. But the doctors will remain experts on their on in their own domain. So what we in 2015, much, much before the COVID, actually, we started a collaboration in Asia with doctors. It started with a very modest initiative, having 20 doctors and 20 journalists in one room. And over the last six years, much before COVID, this became really a pan-Asia network of collaborators, of doctors, public health experts, virologists, and our team of fact-checkers and journalists. Today, it has a, the, it's a part of an initiative which is called First Check, which is essentially a fact-checking platform in which we have more than 50 doctors from across the world now, not only from Asia, and then our team of you know, journalists. And what we do is that if our team has any question, if they have any doubt, they approach these doctors in different parts of the world and ask them, what do they think about it? How can we get this particular data from your country? How can we confirm this thing from your country? So they give that expert advice, insight, and also their network. So I think building collaboration for journalists is extremely, extremely important. And I think this is also the future in terms of uh, reaching out to broader audiences, that we don't just praise each other as a journalist, but uh, and talk to it only just between us at press clubs and newsrooms, but we build a larger ecosystem because we also need people who read our stories at the end of the day. And these doctors actually help us 
to spread the word about the great work the journalists are doing on the ground. They tell them, no, this is a great story. I recommend medical college students to read it. I recommend policymakers to read it. So we also get more audience for big watchdog stories on health. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So thank you, Syed. And of course, everyone on the websites uh, be behind Syed work, you can find a lot of uh, information. As we mentioned the experts, um, I wanted to tell you also that in the guide you find quite a lot about that too. Uh, as, because we are, as journalists, we really rely on their help very often. And as I mentioned before, um, Catherine and I, we work with academics. And uh, we believe, of course, it's a very fruitful collaboration, as uh, Syed just said because it's important. We are like two parts of the same uh, goal in a way, but we believe it's super important. And here maybe as we have a, a few more minutes, uh, we really believe that it's important that you always recheck your expert. So what does it mean? As we said, um, and also Syed underlined this, I mean, of course, this is a field uh, with a lot of money at stake. Is a complex field. Uh, it's a field of a lot of jargon and uh, for journalists can be very complex. And as we know, being such a complex system, uh, we really need to know who's the expert, right? So this is first one problem because to assess if the expert, because I mean, everyone can say, hey, I am the expert, but maybe it's not really true. You need to learn a lot about the background. And then we believe it's always important to recheck uh, their network, their potential conflicts of interest, because this can be influencing very much their uh, positioning. So also the advice they're going to give to you as a journalist. And we do know in the guide, there is a whole chapter about the influence. Uh, what does it mean to be influenced? And we start with the provocation in this guide. We say, you are being influenced because we are just humans, right? So also the experts at the end of the day are just humans. And we do know, you find a lot more about this in the guide, that conflicts of interest are not only and always financial. Money is important, of course, but there are also very important aspects. Like, for instance, there is a reputation status the ego, right? So um, it's very important that you place your expert where he belongs in his constellation of uh, contacts too. So um, just to give you like a couple of tools uh, to do that, because it would be really best practice before you call an expert or you send an email, check what is all about this guy or this lady. Uh, one way to do that, uh, of course, you can use any um, browser to do your own research. Uh, Google has some advantages here because you can use like the so-called operators. So you can like look for a PDF or look for a PowerPoint presentation. But we anyway uh, use also other browsers because, of course, uh, Google has the downside that is um, establishing a profile. So sometimes uh, it will show you results that Google thinks are good for you, but maybe it's not exactly the case. So we always recommend to use different uh, search engines if you want to really investigate. And then we recommend you if you want to check your expert. Uh, first of all, whatever study or paper article that is published in the biomedical world of things and in public health, it comes with the so-called disclosure, which is a little bit what we tried to do uh, at the beginning of our presentation, declare uh, where do I have actually conflicts of interest with. Uh, in this case, uh, I do have a conflict of interest with the British Medical Journal because I publish with them. So um, it, will, it would be extremely difficult for me to write a very negative piece about the British Medical Journal, right? So um, keep in mind that uh, at the bottom of every published paper or study, you have the so-called disclosure. So people are supposed to say, okay, I'm paid by GIJN, I'm paid by Pfizer, I work with the Swiss government, whatever it is. 
um, pay attention though, because as the conflict of interest declaration or disclosure is a voluntary thing, um, very often we are selective. Uh, this is also, at times, it's just a natural thing. Uh, people sometimes forget things or they claim so, and sometimes for them it's better so, because maybe it doesn't sound so good. Uh, so we also recommend you to make your research as wide as possible and look for uh, keywords on the internet like bio, uh, curriculum, uh, and also like we also always recommend look for uh, congress programs because there are different bios that are published in different places. So by comparing them, you might have a, an idea, a better idea. And then we also recommend you actually to ask the question to your expert. Do you have actually conflict of interest? What, are, what is your profile? With whom do you work together? Because this could also be very helpful because it helps you like placing the expert's opinion in a framework, right? Which doesn't mean, I mean, there are also uh, people conflicted, which can give you really uh, a good support as a journalist, but we believe it's really very important. In the guide, you find also some specific um, tools to do that, because I mean, like with the time you learn, uh, you learn how to do that quickly. So I wanted to ask uh, Catherine and Syed if we want to expand a little bit about this. So how do you do your homework before you <laughs> yeah, trust I, I your experts? It's, uh, it's, 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 very important, it's a very important topic, uh, especially uh, if uh, the expert you have in front of you is uh, considered as a key opinion leader. Uh, because uh, um, being a key opinion leader, it means uh, that uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is considering you as very useful because you are high profile in the, your university, in your hospital, and so on. You are a good communicator, you have a great charisma. Um, often, uh, pharmaceutical industry is facilitating uh, as well uh, for those people uh, to publish more articles in prestigious journals and so on. But a key opinion leader is not, um, forcingly, very strong at methodology, uh, very strong in, uh, in its topics. So, uh, but uh, you see them on the media all the time. So I think it's really important. You don't have to be uh, uh, disgracious or someone, but just to, to ask this question for the sake of uh, transparency. Uh, you, it's, you need to give it to your audience because uh, your audience is not uh, knowledgeable how science works, how uh, power works in this, uh, in this field. And um, uh, I think it's our duty to be, to be transparent, to be, uh, even if we are not very comfortable because it's not, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, we, we tend to have a harmonious uh, relationship to other people. So here maybe you, you might be able to be uh, in conflict with but uh, I think it's important to stick to that and to remind those persons, even if they honestly think they are not under influence, we have plenty of good, uh, of well done research uh, that shows that uh, without any doubts, they are in, under influence. And uh, it doesn't mean they are a bad person, it doesn't mean uh, they are corrupted or so on, but. Um, uh, we are not machine. Uh, we are under influence. There are a lot of mechanisms that are, uh, uh, are playing their role here. And it's just uh, for the sake of modesty. Even if you are a great professor and so on, uh, you have to acknowledge you are just human. And uh, those mechanisms, they apply to you. Uh, nobody learns in the medical school how to deal with it. Uh, I, I can remember at the beginning of my career, I was quite naive and I thought those people, they know how to deal with it, but that's not the case. Very obviously, uh, Serena and I, we saw that all the time, every time we, we made an investigation, uh, we over overstate our, uh, the independence of our mind. We are too kind to ourselves. And, uh, and the higher uh, position you have, uh, the more you, you are prone to, to think, uh, yes, but I'm such uh, a, a big number here in this field. Uh, uh, I, I'm not, uh, and, and the people are sincere when they, when they say so, but, uh, but you can see when they assess uh, studies, they are more prone to favor 
uh, results that are compatible with their expectations and they will minimize uh, uh, conflicting results and so on. So uh, I think uh, we have to do the math and we see the audience uh, there is grateful for it because people want to know about it. They, they, they don't want to, to be kept in illusion and so on. Uh, we have a lot of polls showing that uh, patients and audience wish to, uh, to have transparency regarding conflicts of interest. It doesn't mean they will leave the doctor, they will not listen to this expert, but they want to know. And, uh, and we have to, uh, to honor this, uh, this wish. I think it's our duty. Say it. I know. No, wonderful. I think I think like the key is to be honest also that you know we uh, you need to start investing actually your time and you know energy to build your contact base. You can't suddenly call someone for a quote and uh, and on a phone and he doesn't know you, he doesn't know your work, and uh, you just are happy with that quote. I believe in journalism, the way you invest in a lot of other things, you really need to invest in people who are experts in different domains. You need to meet them, uh, have a cup of coffee with them, even when you don't need their quote, actually. So you just build a relationship, understand their knowledge, their depth of knowledge, so that you are also in a much better position to see whether they are really good on this subject or not. And whether they clearly, sometimes people know a lot of stuff, but they don't know how to communicate that. So I think it's a long-term investment in journalism that you should start building your you will uh, contact your people around you who have a different domain expertise. They can be from your country. They can be from other countries. You can do it over the email or the Zoom call or the phone call. But it's a long-term investment of building uh, a list of at least experts who have a very clear scientific understanding of subjects which are related to your stories. Yeah, and I mean, um, unfortunately, this is also, again, is a field uh, that is really difficult to improvise into. Uh, that's uh, something that it's ever since a problem and uh, clearly in these two years uh, emerged as a bigger problem because uh, we have seen like uh, what we also call but pandemic journalism, right? Uh, which uh, was often improvised. As uh, Syed said before in his presentation, I think we all agree about that. I mean, uh, this is not a field that traditionally uh, sees uh, like plenty of reporters in any newsroom. Uh, we also have, unfortunately, and this I believe is, uh, is a global phenomena, uh, also in the newsrooms we have uh, conflicts of interest. I mean, one uh, red flag, because I mean, I believe that spotting red flags can help a lot in our field. One red flag, typical, if you maybe see on a, on a newspaper an article uh, of a journalist that is reporting um, studies result uh, from a congress, medical congress. That's very often a red flag, because uh, congress, medical congresses, of course, there are also places for uh, medical doctors and scientists to learn something, exchange new results, discuss or be together, like exactly we do at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference, right? We come together to, to be networking, exchanging, learning from each other also. But the point is that that medical um, congress and conferences uh, the closeness with uh, the industry that has an interest in this field, it's very tight because these are normally events that are sponsored by, com by companies having an agenda. And this brings also many problems. So when you see on a newspaper um, a journalist just reporting, like, say, at the conference, uh, they were presented this amazing result about this uh, soon coming new drug and you don't find in this article for instance the title of the study how how to place it and maybe some critical opinion as well uh, this is already a red flag because it means that probably the journalist was a bit passive it was there maybe found amazing one presentation and maybe the, the expert speaking was such a good speaker and we are just human again and then you kind of copy paste uh, this is a warning that's a red flag 
but of course again um you don't, you can't really improvise so if you want to because maybe the our audience today we have also some pandemic journalists right <laughs> some people that in the last two years had to start and now they are trying maybe to learn more uh we can only recommend you to read study uh buy good books um you know like now there is also on the internet there is a lot of information in the guide we try to put as many as possible there is like an appendix with books um most of them in, in english uh, of course uh, practically all of them but many of them they can really be helpful to to come into this uh, framework uh, mentality and also at, as Syed uh, said in his presentation i mean also to work with numbers you need to to go into this frame right so it's not something that you can uh, really really improvise uh, Syed we have a few minutes left i wanted to ask you like uh, because we are based in Europe and especially in Switzerland and it's a to totally different setting uh, of course in many things uh, compared to your country uh, could you give our audience some more specific indications about how you investigate the health system in that part of the world because uh, of course there we have um, I want to say this very frankly the guide has been anyway written by two Europeans uh, edited together with Americans and uh, we tried of course to to to, to keep our, our uh, landscape as open as possible and in the appendix you have everything about every country but still they are different there no, so no, I think, I think, at least, some... yeah yeah no I think I think the key is actually not to look for big stories keep doing small stories don't wait for a Pulitzer winning story and then say, you know, I want to do a one story which will change everything. That story may happen and may not happen. But I think key is keep doing small, small, short, short stories, well-written, nicely documented stories. And that will also give a chance eventually to do a big story. And as I said, in most of newsrooms, there's no health editors actually, no health correspondents. I think the majority of the publications, particularly in the regional languages, is very important. Now, if you have shown interest into this field, improve your game, improve your knowledge, read books, uh, meet people more, collect all the documents which are available there, like the budget reports, the, the you know, clinical data reports, even the COVID-related, all the data is now public in India and a lot of other countries in the region. And try to go through this data again and again, numbers again and again, reports again and again, just to make sure that you understand it, what's happening. And then make sure when you write, uh, you really write well, because that's also the challenge. You know, if you don't write well, uh, it has to be, a, it, it, you keep your biases, you keep your opinions out of the story and do good stories. It's short, good stories once in a while. And then you get a chance to do big investigative stories in the process. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I think we are like just really, we have two minutes left. Unfortunately, there are no questions coming from our audience. I, I don't know if like we are overwhelming them with uh, too much information, maybe that can happen, of course. I mean, we can only recommend you GIJN as a resource because on the website of GIJN.org, you have uh, several tools, of course, that you can use to improve, to feel stronger. Uh, maybe we can do a last round. Catherine, uh, what would be your take-home message you want to share with us? Uh, you have to unmute. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, well, the, the take-home message, I think uh, uh, it's, it's important um, uh, that uh, journalists uh, don't uh, think they are here in this crisis on a mission. Uh, they are not on a mission to promote an agenda that seems right to them. I think uh, they are here uh, uh, to, to make good reporting, to make transparent reporting, to be accurate, to, uh, uh, and not to worry with this serve, this agenda or this agenda. I think uh, people are grown up, our audience are grown up. They are able to, to make, uh, to build their own opinion if we present them uh, well, research, well research stories as uh, Sayed underlined, I think it's very important. So we must focus uh, on uh, doing the best possible reporting, the most transparent reporting. Uh, don't be afraid to ask inconvenient questions. That's our duty. We are the only one uh, who do this. Uh, 
Nobody does it. Uh, and if uh, uh, journalists start to uh, to think they are here to help uh, one side of the of the story, uh, they fail. Uh, they they won't do this. Governments, company, they have really powerful communication apparatus. They don't need us to be more powerful, but people need us to be watchdogs, to be uh, to uh, to use our capacities, our knowledge, our uh, network uh, in order to uh, deliver better information to them. We badly need it now. So yeah, do yeah. you want to leave us? Say, yeah, I would say verify. Verify, verify before publish anything. Yes, well said. So everyone, we leave it there now and uh, you will find plenty of resources on the conference website. Uh, there you find also our presentations so you can just download them and uh, play them for yourself. And of course, our contacts, you easily find them on the web. So we are around. And thank you very much. Thanks to our Thanks speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also to the team that helped us a lot today. Okay. Bye-bye, so everyone. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye.